Penguin Random House Audio presents The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill, family and defiance during the Blitz, by Eric Larson. Read for you by John Lee, with a note read by the author. A note to listeners. This is Eric Larson. It was only when I moved to Manhattan a few years ago that I came to understand, with sudden clarity, how different the experience of September 11, 2001 had been for New Yorkers than for those of us who watched the nightmare unfold at a distance. This was their home city under attack. Almost immediately, I started thinking about London and the German aerial assault of 1940-41 and wondered how on earth anyone could have endured it. Fifty-seven consecutive nights of bombing, followed by an intensifying series of nighttime raids over the next six months. In particular, I thought about Winston Churchill. How did he withstand it, and his family and friends? What was it like for him to have his city bombed for nights on end and to know full well that these air raids, however horrific, were likely only a preamble to far worse, a German invasion from the sea and sky, with parachutists dropping into his garden, panzer tanks clanking through Trafalgar Square, and poison gas wafting over the beach where once he painted the sea. I decided to find out, and quickly came to realize that it is one thing to say, carry on, quite another to do it. I focused on Churchill's first year as Prime Minister, May 10, 1940 to May 10, 1941, which coincided with the German air campaign as it evolved from sporadic, seemingly aimless raids to a full-on assault against the city of London. The year ended on a weekend of Vonnegutian violence, when the quotidian and the fantastic converged to mark what proved to be the first great victory of the war. What follows is by no means a definitive account of Churchill's life. Other authors have achieved that end, notably his indefatigable but alas not immortal biographer Martin Gilbert, whose eight-volume study should satisfy any craving for the last detail. Mine is a more intimate account that delves into how Churchill and his circle went about surviving on a daily basis. The dark moments and the light, the romantic entanglements and debacles, the sorrows and laughter, and the odd little episodes that reveal how life was really lived under Hitler's tempest of steel. This was the year in which Churchill became Churchill, the cigar-smoking bulldog we all think we know, when he made his greatest speeches and showed the world what courage and leadership looked like. Although at times it may appear to be otherwise, this is a work of nonfiction. Anything quoted comes from some form of historical document, be it a diary, letter, memoir, or other artifact. Any reference to a gesture, gaze, or smile, or any other facial reaction comes from an account by one who witnessed it. If some of what follows challenges what you have come to believe about Churchill and this era, may I just say that history is a lively abode full of surprises. Eric Larson, Manhattan, 2020 Bleak Expectations No one had any doubt that the bombers would come. Defense planning began well before the war, though the planners had no specific threat in mind. Europe was Europe. If past experience was any sort of guide, a war could break out anywhere, anytime. Britain's military leaders saw the world through the lens of the Empire's experience in the previous war, the Great War, with its mass slaughter of soldiers and civilians alike and the first systematic air raids of history, conducted over England and Scotland using bombs dropped from German zeppelins. The first of these occurred on the night of January 19, 1915, and was followed by more than 50 others, during which giant dirigibles drifting quietly over the English landscape dropped 162 tons of bombs that killed 557 people. Since then, the bombs had grown bigger and deadlier, and more cunning, with time delays and modifications that made them shriek as they descended. One immense German bomb, a 13-foot, 4,000-pounder named Satan, could destroy an entire city block. The aircraft that carried these bombs had grown larger as well, and faster, and flew higher, and were thus better able to evade home-front defences. On November 10, 1932, Stanley Baldwin, then Deputy Prime Minister, gave the House of Commons a forecast of what was to come. I think it is well for the man in the street to realise that there is no power on earth that can protect him from being bombed. Whatever people may tell him, 
the bomber will always get through. The only effective defence lay in offence, he said, which means that you will have to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you want to save yourselves. Britain's civil defence experts, fearing a knockout blow, predicted that the first aerial attack on London would destroy much, if not all, of the city and kill 200,000 civilians. It was widely believed that London would be reduced to rubble within minutes of war being declared, wrote one junior official. Raids would cause such terror among the survivors that millions would go insane. London for several days will be one vast raving bedlam, wrote J.F.C. Fuller, a military theorist, in 1923. The hospitals will be stormed, traffic will cease, the homeless will shriek for help, the city will be a pandemonium. The Home Office estimated that if standard burial protocols were followed, casket makers would need 20 million square feet of coffin wood, an amount impossible to supply. They would have to build their coffins from heavy cardboard or papier-mâché, or simply bury people in shrouds. For mass burial, the Scottish Department of Health advised, the most appropriate type of grave is the trench grave, dug deep enough to accommodate five layers of bodies. Planners called for large pits to be excavated on the outskirts of London and other cities, the digging to be done with as much discretion as possible. Special training was to be provided to morticians to decontaminate the bodies and clothing of people killed by poison gas. When Britain declared war against Germany on September 3, 1939, in response to Hitler's invasion of Poland, the government prepared in earnest for the bombing and invasion that were sure to follow. The code name for signalling that invasion was imminent or underway was Cromwell. The Ministry of Information issued a special flyer, beating the invader, which went out to millions of homes. It was not calculated to reassure. Where the enemy lands, it warned, there will be most violent fighting. It instructed readers to heed any government advisory to evacuate. When the attack begins, it will be too late to go. Stand firm. Church belfries went silent throughout Britain. Their bells were now the designated alarm, to be rung only when Cromwell was invoked and the invaders were on their way. If you heard bells, it meant that parachute troops had been sighted nearby. At this, the pamphlet instructed, Disable and hide your bicycle and destroy your maps. If you owned a car... Remove distributor head and leads and either empty the tank or remove the carburetor. If you don't know how to do this, find out now from your nearest garage. Towns and villages took down street signs and limited the sale of maps to people holding police-issued permits. Farmers left old cars and trucks in their fields as obstacles against gliders laden with soldiers. The government issued 35 million gas masks to civilians who carried them to work and church and kept them at their bedsides. London's mailboxes received a special coating of yellow paint that changed colour in the presence of poison gas. Strict blackout rules so darkened the streets of the city that it became nearly impossible to recognise a visitor at a train station after dark. On moonless nights, pedestrians stepped in front of cars and buses and walked into light stanchions and fell off curbs and tripped over sandbags. Suddenly, everyone began paying attention to the phases of the moon. Bombers could attack by day, of course, but it was thought that, after dark, they would be able to find their targets only by moonlight. The full moon and its waxing and waning gibbous phases became known as the bomber's moon. There was comfort in the fact that bombers and, more importantly, their fighter escorts would have to fly all the way from their bases in Germany— a distance so great as to sharply limit their reach and lethality. But this presumed that France, with its mighty army and Maginot Line and powerful navy, would stand firm and thereby hem in the Luftwaffe and block all German paths to invasion. French endurance was the cornerstone of British defensive strategy. That France might fall was beyond imagining. The atmosphere is something more than anxiety, wrote Harold Nicholson, soon to become Parliamentary Secretary at the Ministry of Information, in his diary on May 7, 1940. It is one of actual fear. He and his wife, the writer Vita Sackville-West, agreed to commit suicide rather than be captured by German invaders. There must be something... 
Sample complete. Ready to continue? Complete. Ready to continue?